my name is Jos Seroine, and I'm joined here with Joni Heik, Niemi, and Sakari Nahi. Guys, let's have a quick introduction. So yeah, my name is Joni Heik, Niemi. I am the CEO of Divisiona. I've been working with Azure since 2008, since the first preview, and I've been a Microsoft Regional Director since 2015. Excellent. Nice to see you guys. Welcome to the Azure Deck. It is summer in Finland, thus I'm wearing shorts. Unlike these other dudes, I don't know what's up with that. I'm the CEO of Azure, and I've been developing on Microsoft Stack since 2001 professionally, and welcome to this session. Excellent. I didn't have my shirt on, but I did bring my Azure shades, and it's really bright out here, so let me use this for a moment. I so, can see myself. Yes, nice. So so first, let's talk a bit about the, the, the state and, and Sakari, would you like to start with the digital e economy here in Finland? Yeah, uh, the first thing we wanted to mention when we are talking about the state of Azure in Finland is if you look at this digital economy and society index uh, gathered by some agency in Europe that tracks indicators of the digitalization across the EU countries, you can see that Finland is on place two. Uh, Denmark is ahead of us and the rest of countries are behind us. That tells us naturally that on the topic of cloud journey and cloud maturity, we are quite up there. And in Finland, currently, we are looking quite heavily at cloud native and platform as a service and innovation of applications instead of simply infrastructure. And this is just to set the context for the talk. Uh, let's see our topics next, and I'll let you say a word about those. So we contemplate a bit on, on the topics, what would be super interesting to hear, and also what would be a little bit of fun to learn during this next, next 30 minutes or so. So we'll have a look at the state of Azure here in Finland. Then we move on to Azure security, and then to evolution of platform as a service. And we'll wrap up with the top peaks from Microsoft Build this year. So if we start with Azure in Finland and the state of cloud in, in Finland, or perhaps in the Nordics. Joni, I know you've been working quite a bit with this topic. Yeah, thanks. Uh, as Zakkar mentioned, uh, we've got a lot going on in the digital society terms, and what's been cool in the last uh, half a year or a few months has been the practical announcement of a Finnish data center. And I think that is something that everybody building the cloud uh, services uh, here in Finland has to think about. Um, uh, let me go quickly through the key announcements there. So uh, Microsoft and Fortum are building uh, an Azure region here in the Helsinki area. Uh, the data centers are going to be in Espo and Kirkonumme, and they are going to be alive at some point. We don't know the scale schedule yet because there's still the zoning process in the court system, but it's going to happen. My personal guess is 2025. Now, what are you guys thinking about? How is this going to affect the Finnish cloud usage? Just maybe you go first. So I was super happy to hear about this announcement uh, a couple of months ago, and I, I contemplated a bit because majority of the services that I have with my customers running in Azure, they are in West Europe or North Europe. And Sweden Central is now in preview, and it has a fairly good selection of, of the capabilities. So eventually, when, when the Finnish data centers will be available, I'm quite certain, especially that for some workloads like Azure Virtual Desktop, that will be the obvious choice. But for a lot of the other things, if we already have those running in West Europe, I see perhaps less value or less urgency to migrate those to Finland, considering it's still a couple of years away. What about you, Zach? Yeah. Um, if you look at Finland currently and looking at the countries in Europe, uh, it seems that we are a little bit ahead, as seen in the index uh, for of some countries. And us getting a data center, of course, I think speeds up the process. But at the same time, if you look at Finnish companies, like out of top 100 companies, 98% of them has an Azure AD tenant, for example. So it is quite cloudified already. Uh, I don't think it has been a large bottleneck that we haven't had a data center. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, on certain industries like maybe finance and especially healthcare, the data center in Finland might be an added impetus to, to onboard a little bit faster. Yep, I, I think that's a good point. And I think it's also a contractual matter. So even though there is no technical difficulty in deploying something to say Amsterdam or, or Stockholm, or, 
but the thing is that uh, if you have a contract that requires data to be placed in Finland, then that's going to be a hurdle to the migration thing. And I, I think that's going to change something. Uh, well, I already mentioned migration. So uh, we have a service called Azure Resource Mover. I personally haven't seen, seen too much use of it. And, and my impression is that very few customers actually move their services between data centers. What's your take on it, Sake? Yeah, I think it's becoming more and more important uh, with the things like data residency and the current complexity of the legal matters on where the data can be and where it should be. Uh, but at the same time, I haven't seen a lot of market adoption for it yet, maybe because there's not that many data centers to choose from. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I agree on that one. And West Europe has served us really well in the past couple of years. Most public preview features land in West Europe first, so it's obviously you want to start there. Uh, with Resource Mover, I have excellent experience on that one, and then I lost a couple of DNS zones, and nobody has ever been able to find them <laughs> later on. I hope they still exist. They still exist. They do respond to queries, but nobody knows where they are or how to manage them. Let me not mention the domains here. But Sweden has been interesting now because it's ramped up quite rapidly, and I, I know that Denmark has been announced and Belgium is, is, is fast coming along. So we have a lot of choice even before we have something in Finland. Yeah. And back in the day, it would be that, well, if we go to West Europe, perhaps the latency is 40 milliseconds. And that was perhaps a problem. Nowadays, it's less of a problem, mm. mostly because of some of the topics we'll, we'll talk later on. Uh, so, so in that sense, the, the act of, of technical um, migration and moving that's less of a hurdle now. It's more about the, the, the politics and where do we want the data to stay in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one also key constraint there is that the resource mover is still mainly focused on IaaS services. So I have a hard time seeing any modern cloud using a company moving fully using resource mover. So that's going to require other other features. Maybe you can achieve something using stuff like geo-replication and so on, but it's still going to be a project to migrate from a data center to another. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing it also adds to is the, the importance of having an infrastructure as code strategy because that's kind of a key when you want to build something for the cloud there. I think regarding that infrastructure as, as code is it, it's a key point. Yep. But also where I see companies struggling more currently is, is the whole data governance thing. Like, yep. okay, companies are clearly taking the infrastructure as code to on board, but the Data covenants, that's still a little bit on the gray area. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's a good point. Thank you for the segue, because the final point I wanted no, to really? mention on this one, yeah, <laughs> uh, just as if you knew what I was going to talk about. So uh, it was the EU data boundary. So Microsoft announced about a year ago an initiative to bring all the uh, cloud services so that they can be run on the EU region only. And this has been promised to happen by the end of this year. So that's going to be still a bit out there. Uh, but I think that's that's really important because it kind of uh, helps companies have the faith in the Azure and uh, the compliance to GDPR. So this is uh, coming from the Schrems decisions, which kind of challenged the EU US data movements. Uh, the data boundary is coming. It's going to contain um, features that enable the data to actually be stored in the EU, but it also contains processual guarantees from Microsoft's end so that they will not process data uh, outside the EU, for example, in support cases. And I think that's been an interesting movement. Are you seeing any customer demand? I'm seeing some customer demand, not as much as I was perhaps expecting or fearing. And I, I think it took us a little bit of time to understand that the EU data boundary, it's much other things than technology in the sense. It's more about, as you mentioned, the legislation, the processes, the support, everything else. But for Azure AD replica, which is now always stored in the US, that's been the key that we often need to document more, more careful. Yep. Mm. On the whole data residency and data issues and data sensitivity and this thing, where I'm seeing traction with that topic is specific industries. Uh, healthcare, I mentioned before, I think that's one uh, quite clear. Uh, public sector is sometimes quite sensitive with sensitive data, where to go and how to go forward. And if you look at, for example, at the Julie Brill's blog posts, the last one is just a couple of months old or something on this topic, uh, she speaks quite a lot or at least a paragraph about the local data centers as well. And I'm kind of picking something like industry clouds might be a part of that story. So it's not just contractual. There's some technical yep. uh, 
and answers to. Yep, yeah, that, that's a fair point, and it's important to understand that the data boundary is all about the whole Microsoft Cloud, not just Azure. So it's also M365 and so on. Yeah. But hey, that, that's it about the data residency part and Azure locally here in Finland. Let's move on to Azure Security. But why don't you use to pick up the ball on here? Thank you. And, and before we get started with Azure Security, I'm glad that we picked the only day here in Finland when it's sunny. We don't see any clouds in the sky. We will swim later. Sounds good. So Azure Security, sort of a state of the union, if you will, on, on, on that. A lot has happened, but at the same time, the same key elements have been in place for quite some time now. So obviously we have a lot of services and products now that start with Defender for something, Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Cloud, Defender for Cloud Apps and so on. And then obviously we have Microsoft Sentinel. So those two, Defender for Cloud, Microsoft Sentinel, those are the, the, the key building blocks for any security and data estate stance point in that sense. So now what we are seeing is plenty of innovation in terms of security, but also more and more threats and more and more aspects that we need to protect from. And one of the key messages has been lately has been zero trust. And partially I'm happy that we are evolving in the thinking because for the past how many years it's been enable MFA, you are secure. And now we can finally move past that one. But what are your thoughts on security in the sense? Is it just that we enable MFA and we flip a switch and everything is secure? So on the security front, it's moving at a rapid clip like Microsoft is moving faster with that than it ever has before we look at those products you see mentioned they really pushing it along and if you look at the monetization of Sentinel for example it's it's quite a market mover when you look at the competition for that so it's an interesting space and there seems to be in this cloud era there seems to be a clear need for these kind of things uh, personally I, I'm, I have a developer background so where I'm looking at this is like Please, 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 let's not put all of the native apps we create inside network boundaries unless it's necessary. We need to have that capability, but not all of the apps, please. But then there are things in the middle like, you know, zero trust, sure, authenticate, authorize, identify all of that stuff, but also remember your IP filters on your database kind of thing. It doesn't maybe need a network boundary to me. That's been a kind of a struggle with the customers because they are like only MFA. Yep. or all the network everywhere and there's this middle ground we should look at too yeah. so i don't feel strongly about this but a little bit yeah yeah i, I can see that thank you sir you only anything to add here um, i pretty much agree with what Saka said uh one observation maybe is that uh the basic technology listed as the group of products there uh, i think that's all valid and it's becoming more and more solid every time we see a new iteration come out from microsoft but uh one thing i am seeing uh, something happening here is that the customers need more and more processes and more and more organization around their security so we're not talking much more about how to monitor these logs actually and how are we going to react to something because the time frame from a breach to an attack or actual damage being done it's shortening all the time yeah. so that that is kind of something where it just technology won't help unless you have automatic remediation for everything but you typically don't so you need some kind of a security task force to react to all those threats and i, I think that is something we're going to see happening but but uh, i think that as well as zero trust is a problem because customers don't really know what are all the components they should do yep agreed on Microsoft Sentinel, uh, it's it's been evolving so rapidly lately that often when I, when I have a chance to talk with somebody about that, often we hear we have too much stuff being ingested to Sentinel. It might be too costly for us, or we don't know what it's going to cost us, but who's looking after it? this? If we get an alert, if we get incidents, whose responsibility is it? Yeah. So this sort of thinking on having a light security operations center would be ideal and yep. sentinel is of course flexible for that but then you also need to plan for that a little bit i really want to hear your thoughts on on i had a, i had a discussion with a customer who has the situation of they want to be compliant with a standard and there's this policy in azure where it expects mfa on for example deployments but then you deploy stuff with your CI CD pipeline and there are service principles involved and there's no personal MFA for the pipeline and they can't put that policy on, but the standard might kind of expect that kind of thing. And that kind of shows me the complexity and confusion of, you know, Microsoft as well, what kind of approaches there are. And then there's some person who comes and checks the compliance for a standard who is not an Azure expert, of course. 
and they have this, oh, why is this red? And you try to explain things to them. How do you how do you see this space going forward? Is it something that you get a handle? Yeah, I, I see there's often or almost always there's a solution for these uh, edge cases where you cannot do what it literally asks you to do. There's a recommendation for something like this, but it requires an in-depth understanding also in the security control so that you know that when we cannot enable MFA for this type of an identity, how do we mitigate? How do we do it otherwise? Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to make a prediction. I think we were we had all forgotten about signed installation packages. I, I think we're going to get back to them at some point. So then there is going to be a developer who, who personally signs the installation package using MFA. And then the pipeline may not be that strongly authenticated, but the application won't be run unless it's signed. So I think we're going to see multiple layers of security on that DevOps thing. And if there's a bug, we all know who to blame. Yeah, exactly. How handy. Yeah, yeah it's always the developers, I know. <laughs> uh, one, of, one, one of the things with, with security is that back in the day, you would go to domain controller event logs to figure out if something is amiss. So now we've evolved quite a bit, but it's often easy to say, let's go for zero trust. But there's plenty of things we still have to do before we get to sort of the highest maturity level in crisis. But enough about security for now. Let's move on to evolution of platform as a service. Sorry, please. Thank you, sir. Ah, evolution of platform as a service. It's been it's been quite a while when Azure was commercially made available with the platform as a service as the spearhead. Like Amazon mm. was there with the infrastructure, and Microsoft was like, let's 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 shake the tree and do something different. And now, if you look at this build, if you've been listening to build and you look at the kind of releases that come related to platform as a service, now all services are a little bit platformy as a service. You know, there's automated management, security, all kinds of things. At the same time, if you look at the core platform and service services, it's like Azure Container Apps became GA, and that's basically it. Okay. So not that many things came out. There's like developer experience in increases and increments and the improvements. What is that word? And it feels to me that the evolution of PaaS is death by a thousand cuts. It's it's not uh, it's not revolution. It's these small steps going forward towards a good direction, and we have reached the maturity. And I think if you guys think about your past, like when was the last time you told the customer that oh yeah, this business need cannot be satisfied with cloud native things with platform as a service. It's been like years, the plot, I, I think 2016, 2017 or something. So platform as a service is pretty mature. Yep, that, that is a good point. Uh, I personally think that uh, before last November or something, we still had uh, SFTP server, which we had to <laughs> install using a VM. Yeah, but now finally. we have that as a blog yeah. preview. Finally, it's there. Uh, yeah, that's that's something. That's something new. But but really, we have pretty few things coming on. Uh, really new features. And of course, like you know, uh, in the build now, it was released to app service. Uh, there's gRPC, so Google Remote Procedure Call support. That run right. on HTTP by so HTTP two version and those are like uh, five to seven year old technologies yeah. or something yeah. like that and now they are in absolute so there's and GRPC is great like you know it's 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 practically good that we have that support now so there are meaningful things that we receive on the past space but still has that like been a some kind of bottleneck for development it has not we just have to circumvent it somehow. Yeah, one of the things that I'm seeing with evolution of platform as a service now is that the the new innovations are not major like we expect them to be. We mm -hmm. always expect some sort of new paradigm to become available. That yeah, where's change. the phone beneath my seat, man? Yes. Where's the phone? So everything changes. So so in that sense, I'm I'm happy now that we are sort of getting back to the basics. So Often, when you mentioned that that you might not need a virtual machine or anything can be done with cloud native, one of the things that I'm happy to see now is that we're sort of getting, going back to the basics with network security. Yeah. So for a lot of the platform as a service capabilities, there's now a checkbox. Would you like to bind this to a virtual network mm. to ensure that you can actually route the traffic as you like, yeah. both bringing in security, but also ensuring that you're optimizing how how the application works. Are you are you seeing the need or are you utilizing this capability? Yeah, yeah, we're seeing some of it, and and the need for networking solutions have, has really grown in the last months because there has been this at least the. Uh, 
experienced threat of uh, DDoS attacks from maybe our neighbor state or something like that. Uh, I, I think that has pretty much uh, improved the discussion on matters like this. And I think that also describes the past evolution in more practical terms, because uh, really, um, Companies uh, companies see all kinds of threats and they they really need uh, practical tools for fixing those things. So many of the past evolutionary steps have really improved our capabilities to deliver governance and security on top of the basic programming primitives we have it all along. Yeah, the networking bit is, is, is difficult. It's great that to basic tier of fast service like app service, we now have private linking and these other options and capabilities and they are necessary in the world of today. Uh, at the same time, like I said, many, many apps don't need that level of sensitivity uh, and, and protection and security. So I think, like you said earlier, it's a lot about having deeper understanding on what are the actual business requirements, what is the sensitivity categorization classification of data, and what should we do about that? Yep, it's fair. I would be interested to know if our picture is showing. Oh, no, our, our camera has feet. overheated. It's too told. warm in Finland. It's too yeah. warm in Finland. Yeah. Uh, we we suggest you guys move to Finland because it's very very shiny and sunny here. Yeah. Let's move forward to top picks. What, yeah. What's been interesting in build till now, Joni? Please. Well, I, I think the keynote contained a number of uh, incremental improvements, and that been, uh, that's been interesting. Uh, the one thing I would like to pick out is the GitHub Go pilot going to GA. So it's going to be generally available in the summer. And uh, I've been toying with the preview for months now. Uh, it has been an extremely interesting experience, and I'm not going to iterate it fully here uh, due to the constraints on my time. But, but, but let me just say that the naming is pretty apt, so it actually feels like a co-pilot. It is actually uh, like somebody developing there with you. Uh, he or she just proposes me 10 different uh, suggestions for any coding problem, and some of them are really bad, some of them are really good. But, but it's actually pretty enlightening and very interesting when you're looking at something really new. So th that would be my pick. Uh, it also contains some new features. Uh, it's going to have a, an explained function, so it can actually give you an English description of what a piece of code actually does. And that kind of would, I would imagine that would help students and other newer programmers to understand what's really happening. So that's cool. Students are going to get it free. I don't think we have any information on pricing otherwise, but that, that's my pick. Do you think that it will make a meaningful difference in, in our industry? I do. I do. It's, I, I really think it's going to make a difference. And I think it might not, not, might not make it this fall, but it's going to yeah. do it over the years because it's actually pretty good right now. That's very interesting. That's very interesting to try out. Um, for me, my pick, uh, I don't want to pick any of the big ones. So I pick the one that I've seen a lot of pain that developer teams have had, and that's Cosmos DB. Uh, Cosmos DB has a reputation of being a little bit costly. I don't agree with that fully because uh, it's basically the only database you can get 400 requests per second at 20 euros a month, and that totals to two and a half billion requests served a month for 20 euros. That's goddamn impossible on a SQL. So on that end, it's quite nice. But to get there, to get that price tag, to get that price range, is very difficult. It's like partitioning and designing Cosmos DP before the project is nigh impossible. Now, what came out are three features. Uh, one is this bursting capability, meaning that for a five minutes, you your database have been idle. You can use the request units per second at a later time for a certain period of time. There's a lot of restrictions that's on preview, but still that's an interesting thing because it doesn't cost you anything more and it serves when there's peak usage. Then there's merging physical partitions. If you're not familiar with physical partitions, go read the Cosmos DP documentation a little bit. But if you scale your Cosmos DP high, it creates a lot of physical partitions. And if you then downscale it, the physical partitions at a later date, they are not removed. And this causes uh, quite high bottlenecks of performance and throughput. And now you can merge these physical partitions, effectively remove unneeded physical partitions, and that really helps. And I've had many cases where that would have been the choice number one. Now you can do with PowerShell. In the past, they paid me 20,000 to figure out the design and rework it. So that, that's a hefty difference. 
And then there's repartitioning, meaning that if you have a physical partition that is the hot on the hot path, so there's some data people reach out to more in your Cosmos DP, you can designate yourself how the request units per second are set between the partitions. These are all in preview, so it seems Cosmos DP team has been busy. They weren't able to put this in GA for build, but still these are for the Cosmos DP community, things that we have been waiting for, and I'm excited. Cool. Sounds good. On my list, I've got Azure DevBox. And I wasn't really expecting this, and I did not know if I need this, but now I'm quite sure that I actually need this. So back in the day, we had Azure Dev Test Labs that allowed you to provision new virtual machines per demand uh, with, with um, uh, pre-configured setup for, for applications and tooling. And then we got Windows 365 for virtual machines for, for productivity use. And eventually we got uh, code spaces part of GitHub now. And Azure DevWorks sort of gives you the most flexibility out of all of these. And obviously it seems it's, it's built on top of Windows 365, which in turn is built on top of Azure Virtual Desktop. So we're utilizing all of those existing innovations, but now we have a way to spin up real pro dev boxes for developers who need just the specific tooling without needing to worry, how do I run this? How do I get to this? And then we can access those remote. So that's still in private preview. There's a sign up form uh, that was announced yesterday. So sign up, let's see how that goes. So let me get this straight. I can order a big box and you'll walk in it. Yes, that, <laughs> that's how it's going to I be. I think I'll need two. That is simply awesome. Since yeah. we have a couple of minutes of extra time, I want to make an extra pick then. That would yep. be Jocelyn Maui. Yeah, the multi oh. app user interface. What, what is it actually called? It's just Maui, M-A-U-I. Um, that's an excellent piece of technology that actually GA had already before built, but it's been a topic of much discussion in build, and it was also mentioned in the keynote. Uh, that is a uh, successor to Xamarin Forms, and if you want to build applications that are native for a, a mobile application or a mobile environment, and it then can also be used elsewhere, that's pretty cool. It also integrates uh, the previous technology called Blazor. So there are a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, rich client development opportunities there. And I think Maui is actually pretty cool. And I, th I think it's going to make a splash in the coming years. It might bring XAML, you know, up to like zeitgeist of the developer sphere again, you know, so that people are, because XAML has been, you know, down in the dumps. It's it's not that it it doesn't come up often. I don't know if XAML is the right thing to pitch here, but the, okay, you pick that term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's some people like it. Yeah. So in order to use .NET Maui, I need Visual Studio 2022. I think what else? Nothing else. That's it. I do think you can get pie with Visual Studio Code as well. Okay, it's just a question of how much designer support you need. Okay, yeah. makes makes sense. So good picks. There's definitely more. If you know XAML, you can use Visual Studio Code. Yep. See, see, fucking bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for joining for for the state of the Finnish cloud. We we hope this was useful for you. Reach out to us online if you have any further questions. Enjoy the rest of the build. You can see we'll stay here enjoying the sunshine. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the build. Bye.